Well, welcome to H360 Health Talk. We're here with Kyle Davies today, the author of a new and very exciting book called The Intelligent Body, uh, Reversing Chronic Fatigue and Pain from the Inside Out. Uh, Kyle is a coach, an author, a trainer. Uh, he teaches people on how to optimize their well-being, achieve clarity of mind, and perform more effectively at work, home, and in life. Uh, Kyle has spent much of his career pioneering uh, a new approach to treating chronic fatigue and pain, anxiety, and depression. Uh, great book, The Intelligent Body. He also works with individuals and businesses uh, to help them better understand themselves and reach their full potential. Kyle, welcome. Uh, we're glad to see you. And the book, uh, wow, uh, great achievement here, The Intelligent Body, Reversing Chronic Fatigue and Pain from the Inside Out. Uh, why don't we start by having you give us a little background on, on how you got into the whole chronic fatigue and, and you know your approach to treating this uh, from the inside out, as your book suggests. So I'm a psychologist by uh, original trade. I worked in business consulting for about 10 years. Um, I do a whole range of things, really. The thing that interested me most was, was coaching. But one of the things I kind of found in business was that people would wear a mask. So in business coaching, it was dealing with the person in the role. Uh, you know, looking at their skills, their behaviours, how to make them more effective at work. And I just had this feeling that I wanted to get a bit deeper. There was more to that person than the manager that I was seeing. So I went and trained in a whole series of therapies, and I uh, started a, a little practice. I was then introduced to a GP, a general practitioner, doctor over here in the UK. He'd done some of the same sorts of training that I'd done. And he had a particular interest in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome because his girlfriend had it and he was kind of deeply frustrated that as, as a doctor there was nothing that he could do. So he started to kind of tweak some of the, the, the stuff that he'd learned and he'd found that he was beginning to make a difference. So I was introduced to him, we started to work together. Uh, at the time, there was absolutely nothing else available uh, either in mainstream or outside of mainstream that was claiming to be able to make any real difference for people with fatigue and pain type uh, issues. So we thought, oh, this is amazing, you know, we've got something here, uh, it's, it's not complete, but we've got something that seems to be working. Um, so we trained practitioners, we tried to get researched, and that was unbelievably hard, and we failed. Um, and it, it, it is, it's a kind of an interesting thing, really. If you're trying to um, put forward a new idea, especially a therapy, and have it embraced within mainstream healthcare, you come, ac you come up against all sorts of barriers. Uh, that's probably no surprise at all. So um, my, G my GP uh, uh, business partner got to be jaded because as he just wanted to help people. He wasn't particularly interested in business and because we were existing as a business. So he went back to being a, a GP. Uh, I've continued to kind of fly the flag. I've evolved the process and then I've, I've now uh, written this book, really just in an attempt to get the word out. It feels to me like there is the tide is turning and there's beginning to be a greater acceptance of the sorts of ideas that I talk about in, in the book. Yep. So that's the kind of the background of how I, how I got where I am. Yep. Yep. And one of the ideas that you talk about in the book is the relationship between your emotions and your health and well-being. And something that we hear a lot about um, here at Healthy 360 is the role of positivity and positive thinking in your ability to recover when you're living with a chronic illness. Um, can you tell us a little more about this concept and how your understanding of it can lead to recovery? Okay, now, this is, that's a big question. Yeah. Um, so emotion and stress, in my mind, are linked. So if I can talk a little bit about stress to start mm -hmm. with. Uh, for me, uh, our emotional stress can lead, can lead and directly cause physical uh, illness. So I think that you know it's a kind of it's a big statement, but I, I think we're beginning to see that it's a true statement. I think there are two crucial things about stress that are probably often not really viewed, uh, and I think that people often think that stress is that agitated feeling that they have. You know, I've, I've had a stressful day at the, at, at the office. 
Whereas really, I would say that's an emotional feeling that somebody has, and the fact that they're aware of it means they can do something about it. The two really important things about stress, as far as I'm concerned, which bring mind and body together as one, is that firstly, our body can be in a state of stress without us being aware of it. So we should be aware of that in order to do something about it. Well, ideally, that would be the case. But, but it's the case that often we're not. Uh, I remember some years ago reading what I thought was a great book called Healing Without Prozac and Freud by a psychiatrist called Dr. David Servan Schreiber. And in the book, he talks about some research that he was doing where he was really looking at the activity of the brain, blood pressure, heart rate, these sorts of things while putting people under stress. Now, the method he used for putting people under stress was showing them some disturbing films. And he talks about this, this kind of bit, bit, bit in the book where he's saying that he had this lady in, in the lab, she's watching this disturbing film, and he's looking at the heart rate of blood pressure and the activity of the brain, and they're all kind of sky high. So blood pressure's going mad, her heart rate's going crazy, her brain's kind of going bonkers. And he's thinking, oh my God, this lady's in a deep state of stress. So he goes into the lab and he says to her, are you okay? Uh, you know, do you want me to turn this off? And she looks at him with this element of surprise and says, oh, I'm perfectly fine. I'm quite happy watching this. So that was a, that was a person that was, I, as I would say, is kind of locked in their head. So cut off from the body, cut off from feeling. So he's completely unaware that her body is in a deep state of stress. Now, I would also say that that's a person that if she if she goes through life like that, at some point, if she's ex if she's experiencing a lot of low-grade stresses, which many people are in life, there's a very good chance that her body could be stuck in a, in the stress response, which over time will lead to it breaking down and then some form of disease. So that's the first thing. I think the second very important point about stress is that. We can have a physical injury, we can have an illness, we can have a bad diet, we can ingest toxins, we can have a buildup of emotion, and the stress response in the body is exactly the same. Um, and that, as I say, that brings mind and body together as well. So you could have a car accident, you could have a bad case of flu, you could lose a job, and the stress response that's triggered is the same. So again, a lot of people think of stress as something that's in their mind a mental thing. Whereas, in actual fact, it's a full body experience. So when it comes to emotion, again, often people think that emotion is something that's all in the mind. People think that emotion is the end result of thinking. And what neuroscience is telling us is that, well, that's old fashioned. So whilst we know it's possible to change our emotion through thinking, it's very limited because in actual fact, our emotion affects our thinking more than our thinking affects our emotion. So emotion is initially triggered. We have neurons in our heart, we have neurons in our gut, so thus we have like gut feelings. So a combination of the heart, the gut, and the non-thinking part of the brain, or the midbrain, is that's what results in emotion. And then, when emotion is triggered throughout the body and brain, the thinking centers become active. So there's a greater flow of information from the heart to the brain than there is from the brain to the heart. And there's a far greater flow from the non-thinking part of the brain to the thinking part than there is the other way around. So we've been, you know, we've seen for many years now, 20 odd years, that there's been a, a, an entire field that's based on the idea that change the way you think, change the way you feel. And it does work to a certain extent, but my experience of working with people with chronic illness is it doesn't work. So if you're just a bit miserable in your life, you could probably think some happy thoughts and make yourself feel a bit better. It's a lot of hard work and you have to keep doing it. But in my mind, it's it's the wrong way to go because I think ultimately thinking just leads to more thinking. And if you're in a bad mood, you'll probably end up just thinking. And that, that in my experience, that kind of just gets worse. Yeah. But when it comes to actual symptoms, if you're suffering from migraines, headaches, chronic pain, chronic fatigue, stomach and bowel complaints, thinking will not shift your symptoms. And I think that's because emotion affects thinking more than thinking affects our emotion. So that's the kind of view of, of emotion. There's another little bit with that in terms of theory, it, which is that emotion is a non-conscious process that triggers feeling. So we, often people think emotion and feeling are the same thing. And looking at what goes on in the brain, apparently, emotion and feeling is slightly different. So the fact that emotion is non-conscious means that it, it's there and it's being sent, it's being produced, it's being triggered, but if we don't feel it, what we can we know that we can block feelings. 
So, and this is what we do. We do it consciously, we do it unconsciously, we resist. So we can block our feelings, but we can't block the emotion that's going on underneath. So when it comes to the production of symptoms, essentially what happens is that when, when feelings are blocked, the body doesn't stop sending emotion, but the body and brain then think that, well, something is wrong. Because, because if we feel our feelings, we can do something about them. If, we're, if we block them and the emotion is getting pumped, then the body responds as if there's something wrong. So I've, I've, that was a long answer to your question, then, isn't it? So, so Kyle, you, you know, I, I want to get back to a word that you've used a couple of times now. Uh, and and you, you refer to mainstream. So when we talk about chronic fatigue and we talk about fibromyalgia, um, you know, there are many doctors out there that would say, well, that's fibromyalgia especially is, is not a real diagnosis, right? It's, it's you know, it's, uh, it could be misdiagnosed, it could be depression, it could be other things, it, but, but you talk to a patient who says they suffer from fibromyalgia and it's, you know, it's some patients that we've talked to, it's really debilitating. Um, so, so where, where's the medical community in this? I mean, and, and when you see, and you talk to patients with chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia, do a lot of them say to you, you know, gosh, I think, you know, my doc, I went to see my doctor and, you know, I'm, I think I'm misdiagnosed or you, you say, geez, that's, you're displaying these symptoms that you talk about, about the mind and the body and emotions but yet you, the, the, the person says, well, I've walked out of there with a, a diagnosis of depression and I've been put on this, this medication to treat that. What, what do you say about that? Okay, so my view is very simplistic in a way. I think that anxiety, depression, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, these are umbrella terms for what can be a diverse range of symptoms. And I suppose I, I believe that Going back to this idea of stress, the, the metaphor that I use with the people that I work with is I say, well, we have a stress bucket inside of us. And I don't think, therefore, there's a single primary cause. I think there's a multiple range of causes. It's almost like a combination lock. So as that stress bucket gets full with a variety of things, which could be. So, for example, last year I had two clients that came to me with fibro and they said to me, uh, my fibromyalgia has been caused by a car accident. And just as I was saying earlier, a car accident, that will trigger the stress response in the body. Now, I view that as a person with a pretty full stress bucket. The car accident has just filled the, the, the stress bucket to the limit, and then they've exhibited symptoms. Now, it's a very simplistic way of looking at it. Now, why does one person get depression, one person get chronic fatigue? I'm not sure I can answer that. It's probably due to their, their genetics, their natural wiring. One thing I would say, though, is that everyone that I've worked with, with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia will have, at some stage earlier in their life, experienced some milder symptoms. So my perspective is this, that the body works in a way that it's trying to get our attention. And if we look at a full stress bucket as being as as the body then needs to try to get our attention, uh, it's it's going to shout at us in some way with symptoms. So my view is that the, our body uses emotion as a way of giving us feedback. So I think emotion is a kind of feedback mechanism about our interaction with our environment. In exactly the same way as if, if you get, if, you know, when you're hungry, how do you know you're hungry? Well, I feel a rumbling, you know, uh, sensation. Now, of course, that rumbling will come and then it'll go and then it'll come back. And if you don't eat for a long time, you know, three, four, five days, then you don't get a mild rumbling anymore. What you get is something more intense. So the body, it's almost as if the body will crank up the volume of the symptoms that it sends uh, over time. But interestingly, the message behind that symptom is still exactly the same. So I've experienced this with people with CFS, fibro, and those sorts of things, is that everyone starts off with some mild symptoms. It could be headaches, it could be a bad stomach, it could be problems sleeping, anxiety, uh, low mood. It always starts with a little bit of that. And either those symptoms just naturally subside, or they do something, they take some, some meds, or they take some pills, or potions, whatever, to try to get rid of those symptoms. What they find is the symptoms come back, and they're either more intense, or they've morphed into something else. 
and eventually they come back as full-blown uh, CFS or fibro. So, in terms of, you know, the, I suppose I have a very different view of medicine, as you can probably tell. Medicine is categorizing us, and at one level it's useful for a person to know, all right, well, this is what's going on with me. But for the most part, the diagnoses that people are receiving are just a label over a cluster of symptoms. Um, and it may be that medicine knows what's going on, but it may be, as is in the case of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, that medicine doesn't exactly know what's going on because they're diagnosed through exclusion. So people have symptoms of blood tests, the blood tests don't show up anything. So if their symptoms persist after a period of time, they're offered a diagnosis which could be post-viral fatigue, uh, chronic fatigue, chronic, chronic immunodeficiency syndrome, or fibromyalgia. And it, that will generally depend on uh, what preceded those symptoms and what the main the main symptoms are. So with fibromyalgia, it tends to be pain symptoms, and there are certain pain points that people have. Yeah. Whereas chronic fatigue, the main <clears throat> symptom is, is fatigue. But there is huge, huge uh, overlap. You know, there's fatigue, there's pain, there's brain fog, there's flu-like flu-like symptoms. So there's a whole cluster of symptoms. Yeah, got so it. That's kind of the the, the difference. If that, yeah. that makes sense. So one of the big things you talk about in your book, The Intelligent Body, is this concept called energy flow coaching. Can you kind of take us through that coaching process and what are some of the scientific theories that it draws from? So the, the, I guess when it comes to the health stuff, the main, the main bit of science is the work of Dr. Hans Selye, and that's going back, he's the godfather of stress, going back to the, the kind of 1920s and 30s. So it, that's the idea that a body in a perpetual state of stress eventually breaks down. Um, I also draw on the work of Milton Erickson, the hypnotherapist, because his view was uh, a symptom is purposeful. So the symptom is trying to tell you something. So those, I guess, that the, the, the science there. The neuroscientist Antonio Damasio is the guy that talked about emotion and feeling being different things. So there are a whole load of, of theories that kind of put, that I pull into to the work. Um, in terms of a process, it's about empowerment. Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm inviting people to entertain this idea. Right, well. Your body is producing a symptom. It's not that symptom that that symptom is some necessarily some evil invader. It's your body's trying to tell you something. So well, I'm assuming that it's this a uh, buildup of emotional stress. Predominantly, there may be other stresses, but predominantly emotional stress in that stress bucket. So I kind of work that through. But I, I you know, it's it's giving people a new understanding of emotion. It's, it's putting them back in the driving seat by saying, well, well your emotion is about you. We, we entertain a very kind of outside-in view of life where we believe that life causes me to feel certain, certain things, which is not exactly true. The emotion is not triggered by outside events. The emotion arises and is created within us by the meaning we place upon life, by the kind of the beliefs and values we hold about ourselves, and, and just the kind of flow of consciousness that is life. So I teach people to, to a new understanding of stress, a new understanding of what emotion is, what feelings are, and I get them to realign with that. I think that culturally, in Western culture, we're very externally focused, we're very thought focused, uh, and, and I think we've become disconnected from our physical body, our emotional selves, our spiritual selves. So as a process, it's, it's kind of like that. Everyone has their patterns, if that makes sense. So when I look at I look at the symptoms that people experience, there are patterns and the history repeats itself throughout people's lives. So people often find themselves confronted with the same sorts of things. I've always got the same boss, I've always got the same girlfriend, you know, these sorts of things. So it's understanding that there are kind of lessons to be learned from that, but there are patterns around symptoms and emotional feelings that people have. So that in a nutshell, it's about bringing people back to what I call their true self. Um, and having them kind of be who they are. Because I think that we go through life and we learn to be more of who we're not than who we are. And when that happens, there's that our, our, our emotional flow gets blocked. That's the term energy flow coaching. I think, you know, you, going back to the, the godfather of stress and his studies in the 1920s, you know, now, now fast forward, you know, we, we live in a, just a different environment. We're in a connected world. All these factors that are around us that you know, kind of aid to the stress levels of what we deal with every day. Um, 
and you talk about the being disconnected emotionally and spiritually that 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 disconnect from those you know really important pieces of of the whole body if you will of, of who you are as a person i mean if you look back and draw parallels i mean could we have seen this coming and could could there have been things that we could have done or ways that we could have act or acted or you know maybe ways that we could have uh educated our children or, or helped generation after generation um, probably ways we can educate our children i think one of the one of the issues is that uh emotion sort of dropped through the net so psychology for many years tried so hard to be a science and in doing so was only interested in things that you could measure obviously medicine is was kind of interested in the body as a machine and then kind of Doing, doing operations and giving drugs. So again, you know, looking at kind of specific ailments, specific symptoms of what could be done for them. Uh, so the whole notion of stress and, and, and emotion is a little bit nebulous and therefore was kind of brushed to one side. I think intuitively, people kind of know this that I'm talking about. I think, you know, if, if a person has a, a bad day at the office and they have a, a headache, they know, they intuitively know that it's not right, you know, I've not had a good day, it was frustrating, I wasn't really true to myself. People kind of know that. But if that headache lasts a week, two weeks, three weeks, they go see their doctor, and that intuitive knowledge they kind of have gets swept to one side. So I think that, I think that's one, one issue. I mean, yes, you're right, we, as a culture, and as a society, technology and everything has accelerated way beyond the speed that we've evolved, isn't it, really? You go back sort of I, I, a couple of hundred years and then we lived for thousands and thousands of years in small tribes of, uh, you know, probably 150 people where we knew everybody, life was reasonably simple and now it's completely different and of course what what uh, current life does is it draws us to the external, we've got social media, we've got bright lights, we're, we're trying to fit ourselves to the versions of what we think the world wants to see and I think that exacerbates this problem. But we can't blame those things because people sort of have an opportunity to align with themselves, to be true to themselves, to feel their feelings. It's just that these things are not really taught until now. Of course, it's not just me. There are other people out there that are trying to, to kind of bring this work forward, the ideas forward that, you know, emotion, trauma, all these sorts of things actually have a huge impact on our health and, and well-being. And what we need to be doing is... You know, engaging in life is great, but we need to be understanding kind of how these things manifest and the importance of our emotional feelings. So how can we reduce the stress in our lives, come back to our true selves? Is it through this process that you call creative flow? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, it is. It's, uh, I think that, um, you know, to kind of brief things, I think that we immediately people feel something uncomfortable, usually because our feelings affect our thinking and the thinking brain becomes active. There's usually a resistance to what we feel or a desire to change what we feel. So, you know, I think to begin with, if people can allow whatever they feel to be okay, that can be quite profound. Having a sense that what I feel right now is not a problem and does not need to be solved is, is huge because people really almost unconsciously are trying to get away from how they feel. And what, of course, what they're doing is because they feel that their outside life directly causes how they they're frantically in their head thinking about what they need to change out there in order that they can feel different in here. But how we feel in here kind of flows, and that actually we can feel different in, within five minutes without anything changing out there. So just coming back to ourselves and allowing whatever we feel to be okay. I think it's a profound start and knowing that well I don't have to change how I feel, how I feel in this moment is perfectly okay, it's not a problem, it's, it's me, it may be guided in me to take some action, it may be that I've just got to feel it. But I think that's, yeah, allowing ourselves to be and to feel without trying to fix how we feel is, is, is a very good start. Kyle Davies, uh, author of The Intelligent Body Reversing Chronic Fatigue and Pain, from the inside out. Kyle, we'd like to thank you for joining us uh, today on H360 Health Talk.